Okay. So, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the conference following the premiere of Nasrin, organized by the Association des Élèves Avocats at the Paris Bar School. Um, before we start, could I please ask everyone except the speakers to turn their microphone and the camera off so, so we can really focus on the speakers properly. Uh, but then, of course, if you have questions, do not hesitate to ask them on the chat and we'll be very happy to take them. Um, so we hope you enjoyed discovering the documentary and learning about Nastrin Sotude's incredible dedication to fight for the protection of human rights. She has been sentenced to 38 years in prison and 148 lashes just for having done her job as any other lawyer in the world. She, she's in prison today in a very weak health condition and it feels more important than ever to spread the word and let her situation be known. So, of course, we would have loved to show the film as part of a large event uh, in a real physical theatre, uh, but here we are, and I think it's already a great chance to, to be able to discuss all together. So this evening, we are honoured to have five remarkable speakers. We have writer, director and producer Jeff Kaufman, as well as producer Marcia Ross. They are both joining us from California and, uh, and will stay just for the beginning of the conference. We have Christiane ferral Schul, who is the former head of the Conseil National des Barreaux and who gave her name to the new class of 2021 at the Paris Bar School. We have Azadeh Kian, Iranian-French sociologist who teaches at the Université Paris d'Hydro. And we have Jacques Bouissou, former member of the Paris Bar Council, who created the International Observatory for Endangered Lawyers. Um, so Jeff, Marcia, I think we are eager to hear about the making of the film in Iran. Um, simply before we start, could, could you perhaps give us an update about Nasrin's so today's situation today, how she's doing? Um, are you in close contact with her family? Do you have any news as to how she's being treated in prison? Yes, first of all, thank you so much for um, hosting this event and bringing people together. Uh, throughout Nazarene's career, the law has meant so much to her, and um, she still holds on to that as an ideal for justice in her country. And I think it's really an important message for every country, uh, respect for the law and making the law uh, treat people equally and fairly uh, and giving opportunity to everyone. Uh, that's what the law could do at its best. And uh, Nazarene recently said when she received an award from the American Bar Association, she said something like, despite all my struggles, I still love being a lawyer. And I just love how personal and, and powerful that is. So, um, uh, you know, in, in your legal work, I hope you keep that as an inspiration. Um, and just as far as Nazreen is concerned, we heard from her husband uh, just a couple of days ago that, you know, she's still in Garchak prison, which is a woman's prison uh, north of Tehran. It's notoriously one of the most foul, uh, inhumane prisons in Iran with uh, bad food, uh, uh, no health uh, care, urine on the floor, overcrowding. Uh, it's just a horrendous place. She is in a prison cell that is um, uh, eight feet by 13 feet wide. There are 12 beds in that one small prison cell. There's no windows in that cell and the, and the ceilings are very low. So um, it's a horrendous place to be, uh, but uh, she is still using her uh, position uh, as a world figure to advance the needs of others. So recently she just declared uh, her support for a whole bunch of women who are on death row uh, in Garchak prison. She just refuses to be silent no matter what they do to her. So we, um... We, well, we started talking to Nazreen in 2016. Jeff had made a previous film called Education Under Fire about the persecution of the Baha'i faith in Iran and who cannot receive an education and are, are persecuted in so many ways. And she, like many cases that she's taken on that other lawyers refuse to take on, she was representing people that, uh, you know, people of the Baha'i faith. And I think he was very taken with this idea of this Muslim uh, woman and others, you know, helping their neighbors who were not of the same, you know, religion where it was quite dangerous for themselves. So we finished our last film. Uh, when we were finishing our last one, we thought, what did we want to do next? Our last one was about Broadway and the theater. 
And we started talking about Nazreen and we thought, you know, she would make a great subject for a film. I mean, she's an extraordinary human being doing extraordinary work. She's very, much better known, by the way, in, in France and around the world than she is in the United States. I mean, that's something that's you know, become abundantly clear as we've made the film. But she's, but she's getting more well known here, obviously. So we approached her in 2016, and, uh, Reza and Nazreen, and we asked them if they'd be open to us uh, making a film about them. We had a lot of conversations. We were very, very concerned about their safety and well-being. I mean, that's a question people always ask. And that was the first question we asked, are you sure? And even throughout the entire making of the film, we asked them many, many times, even, even when we finally finished the film and we would be able to show it to people, we wanted to make absolutely sure, but they were always on board. They continue to be on board. And as, as we, we basically kept the film, you know, under wraps really until October of this year, even though we worked on it for close to four, four October of last year, we kept, we kept it under wraps because we wanted to protect her for as long as we could. I'm going to turn it back to Jeff, but I just wanted to say one thing that um, you'll notice, if, you know, you may have noticed when you see the film, and I certainly, because I've seen it so many times, how many uh, scales of justice does she have? You know, there's pictures, they're everywhere throughout the film. You know, it's uh, it's really amazing how many scales of justice that she has in every facet of her life. It's 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 an image that appears over and over again in the film. Yeah, I, I teased her about it once when, <laughs> when we were on the phone uh, as we were looking through footage, saying, uh, you know, you have these scales of justice all over your office. And please note that in a scale of justice, it's always the woman that's holding the scales, uh, and that really reflects uh, the importance of women in Iran uh, and, and and in the future of Iran. Um, I think I'd like to say something about Nazreen personally, if I could. Uh, Nazreen and her husband Reza, uh, b both of us through our, our work have known many public figures. And sometimes public figures present this one image to the public and that's very useful, but in private they're not the same person and it can be very disappointing. Uh, but having spent so much time with Nazreen and Reza, um, you know, both in, 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 in Zoom calls and Skypes and, and since Nazreen's arrest, talking to her husband Reza under the most difficult conditions, but also going through hours and hours and hours of footage that was carefully smuggled out of Iran so we could make this film. Uh, you know, we've just seen Nazreen as a real person. And I have to say, she's just, she is who you want her to be. Uh, you know, she has this great sense of humor, a smile that could light up a stadium. Uh, but also, uh, even though she's, you know, just a little over five foot tall, she is fierce. Uh, she could knock down a wall with her determination. And she's knocked down a lot of walls, uh, you know, politically and socially. So um, I, I really think she is just a role model, not just for uh, uh, Iran, but really for the world. Uh, I, you know, as we were making the film, uh, you know, it was the era of the previous president whose name we don't want to mention in this country. Uh, but we saw democracy really under assault in the United States as we were doing a film about these remarkable women, not just Nazarene, but a whole community of women uh, who were fighting in a very grassroots and risky way for uh, their rights in Iran. Uh, and I think it put to shame a lot of people who are cowardly in this country who wouldn't stand up for human rights. Uh, and so uh, we always want to say that um, there's, you know, it's vitally important to support Nazarene. It's vitally important to uh, make clear to the Iranian uh, leadership that political prisoners should be freed. But I think it's also really important to go back to our country, whether it's France or the United States or wherever you live, and say, what standards are we living up by? And 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 you can't call someone else out to uh, improve uh, their human rights situation if you're abusing rights or restricting voting opportunities in your own country. And so we hope that uh, this film and Nazarene as an icon can also remind people in America to, um, to improve our record and be as good as we can be. So how did we make this film? So obviously we couldn't really go to Iran. Jeff had made a number of films about Iran, so it would have been impossible for him to go there without getting arrested. And also in order to get the level of intimate footage, you know, if we had gone there ourselves, you know, an American crew on the ground, I mean, we would have just been seen and thrown out or arrested ourselves right away. So it, it was not possible, but Jeff had done this before. He'd found some, you know, he'd been able to find some really courageous people who were willing, as you know, to put them own selves at risk because they care about the subject matter and to follow Nazarene in a very intimate way, you know, with their cameras. That was the way that we were able to get such close up footage of so many aspects of her life from her work and also her personal life. 
and her family and, and her offices with her clients and with her children, which is, you know, part of how we, you know, was that something we really wanted to do was also create a, a fully rounded portrait of this woman, not just the lawyer, but the human being who is that lawyer. Uh, that was very, very important to us. So, and then Jeff and I did travel and we were actually in Paris. We did interviews in Paris. We traveled all over the world to interview other people for the film, which was also really interesting and informative about, you know, for us about Iran. And the other thing uh, about making the film, it was really important for us to, to really portray the country of Iran in a very balanced way and also for the beautiful country it is. I think you know, I don't, I don't know what, you know, our news in this country, if you f watch cable news at all, does not really cover international news. It just really doesn't anymore. I mean, you have to watch BBC or some foreign news to, you know, most European countries, I think, pay a lot more attention to what's going on in the rest of the world, but they, we don't in this country, not if you read the newspapers here. If you don't read the New York Times or the Washington Post, you don't know really what's going on anywhere else. So, and, and, and so what happens for a lot of people is all they know is country to country. You know, what do most people know about even France in this country? You know, very little, especially if you've never visited. And certainly people know very little about uh, about Iran, except what they read in the newspapers between our government and their government. And it's not really, you know, really reflective, you know, uh, of, of many people in the country, certainly not the people. I mean, if you watched, obviously, which you probably did see what happened here on January 6th, that was a very tiny portion of people in the United States. Most of us were home watching our television sets unbelievably aghast at what was happening but and it, and it hardly reflects most people in this country so we really felt it was important to capture sort of the you know the common humanity that we all share people around the world all share so many things in common that are, are that are, do not reflect what their governments stand for but what they are as people i often say that one of my most favorite scenes in the whole film is nazreen picking her son up from school with his backpack and them holding hands because that is a mother anywhere in the world does that, anywhere in the world. So that was one thing. And uh, also the question was, have they seen the film? And yes, uh, Reza had seen the film while, and had told her about it while she was in prison. And when she came home on one of her medical leaves, she did see the film and she was very pleased. And, and typical of Nazreen when she called us uh, to tell us that she'd seen the film. You know, the first thing she said was not about at all about herself. You know, what she was really happy how that we wanted to make this film, that we took it upon ourselves to make this film about her country, but also that we able to really reflect the people in the country in a way that made her feel really good. Not just how we made her look good, but how we made everybody else look good. And that was really important. Let me close with one last thing, if I could. Uh, again, going back to uh, what brings everyone here together, which is the law and something that motivates Nazarene. And, you know, the law is words uh, in a book on pages, but it's also something that is living and moving forward. And uh, there are some lawyers, there are some politicians who want to use the law to restrict rights, uh, to uh, only uh, empower uh, the wealthy and the powerful. And there are others who want to make uh, the law be something that opens opportunity and opens support and equality for all. That's what Nazreen believes. Uh, and uh, I think that's something that we can take uh, to each of our countries as well. Um, you know, let's love the law, let's use the law, and let's remember that uh, it really um, is the best of its intentions if it embraces humanity behind it. And we really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much. This is a this is a very very interesting uh, introduction to the film. Um, if um, for the participants, if you would like to ask any question, do not hesitate to write your question on the chat. There is a chat function um, in the middle, and um, simply to, to to go a bit more in the in the making of the film as such in Iran, we were wondering how. The scenes in in prison and in the courtroom were filmed. How were you able to? Was it a hidden camera? How how could you film those scenes, which are quite impactful? I think uh, we got footage from a variety of different ways. We had crews that we were working with um, in Iran who were following Nazreen. So when you see her uh, at a protest or working with uh, representing the Girls of Revolution Street, who 
uh, put themselves at risk of arrest for taking off their hijabs, or like Marcia said, uh, walking home with her son Nima, or going into a bookstore or, or a theater. That's all someone with a camera walking with her, uh, and also putting themselves at risk. You know, um, it's a bold thing these days to walk around with National Institute today with a movie camera in your hands. Uh, sometimes the uh, camera person would duck behind the seat in the car, but other times they were right there with her. We also were able to get footage from a number of other sources. Um, and sometimes we did some complicated searches, uh, you know, in Farsi uh, and, and stumbled across some footage that was uh, like, if you're talking about the revolution court sequence where Nazarene is representing Sharon and body, I've never seen coverage inside uh, a revolutionary court like that before. Uh, and it shows Nazarene's determination, you know, to face down all these people who are in opposition to her. Um, we got that from a certain source and like um, in, a, in a complicated search. And then within a couple of days, it was just gone and it's not been back since. So we've been blessed by some luck uh, and half of making a documentary is filming and half of it is uh, being a detective and we were lucky to be in both. I'd like to just add to Jeff that um, and you see it in the film, but it's amazing how many people were using their cell phones and their iPads and, and filming things, you know, and then posting them on, on their Facebook pages, you know, or their Twitter feeds. You know, and Jeff spent a lot of time sort of researching, you know, this or, you know, we recognize somebody that was there and then we find a way to get in touch with them. And somehow they knew the person, you know, who actually had been filming it. And then through somebody else, we were able to get a hold of that footage. But a lot of people recorded things. Yeah. And Marcia, is exactly right. You may remember there's a sequence where there's a young man who's on death row um, and Nazarene has been representing him and she hears that he's about to be executed. He's underage. And uh, we had a contact with the family. We were able to reach out to them. They had taped uh, uh, a sequence where they find out that, that he's been executed and the mother starts crying and Nazarene is there. Uh, that wasn't ever public, but through that sort of link of, of people who trust each other, we were able to get that footage. And then the question is putting it all together. So hopefully that you can be the judge, it makes sense. There's a question here. Did you expect Nazarene to be in prison? No, we did not. Although, no, that was a, one of those things that you cannot anticipate when you're making a film. However, I will say that I believe that she knew that she could be imprisoned again because when she took on the case of, of uh, you know, defending Narcos Hosseini and the other young women of revolution, of the, you know, the girls of Revolution Street movement, it was a great likelihood that, you know, they wanted her silenced. You know, they see her as an instigator and also a role model for a lot of these women. And so I think you know, she she had to know in some way this potentially could lead to being arrested. It's not something we ever talked about. And I tell you that as we edited the film, you know, I really started to feel that, you know, so many things that she was saying to the camera or speaking that, you know, you hear in voiceovers that she did know something could happen and that she wanted to make sure that everybody knew what she thought just in case she was silenced again. She got it out there. She said a lot of things that she wanted the world to know about how she felt about what was going on in her country in case, you know, in case her voice was taken from her. And we felt terrible about her being arrested, by the way. Awful. I mean, you have to understand that, you know, that they become like family to us. You know, when you make a documentary and you spend this much time with people, you know, it becomes so much more. You know, you start to feel a deep personal connection with these people. So we personally have been very invested in what's gone on with her, particularly when, you know, she was on the hunger strike, you know, for 46, seven days. And we were extremely <sighs> worried. It was it was horrendous. I mean, every single day was the concern that she wasn't going to make it. So it's it's a big part of our lives and we're constantly in touch with the family. Should I answer the other question that's in the chat? Is that? Uh, yes, perfect. And, and then we'll ask questions to the other speakers. Yes, please. Do. Sure. Uh, a question also came up that says, could I ask how you ensure the uh, anonymity of the people who helped you film the documentary inside of Iran? Uh, we did it a couple of ways. First of all, we obviously uh, n never identified uh, anyone by name, even though uh, we knew who was shooting. Um, but it wasn't just that. It, it's also um, all the people who you see in the film. You know, whenever you make a documentary, you always get a legal release speaking about the law. Uh, and it's a, a release that allows you to use their image in a variety of different ways. And in the United States, it could be like three pages. We had that 
translated into Farsi. And anyone you see in the film, uh, like the gentleman who helps uh, raise bail for Nargis uh, Hosseini, um, that remarkable man, um, he signed a release knowing full well the film would be seen around the world. Uh, it just makes you appreciate uh, the courage and the character of these people. So, uh, but throughout the filming uh, and throughout even editing, uh, we never mentioned the film in any public way. We didn't do any public uh, fundraising, uh, which is not an easy way to make a documentary. We kept everything secret up until the end. And, and even when we had finished editing the film, we reached out to Reza and we said, listen, Reza, that's Nesrin's husband. We said, Reza, um, you know, if you want, we'll, we'll just kill the film. If you feel this will put anyone at risk, um, we'll not release it. And uh, everyone said in one voice, you know, it's important to put the film out, so we did. Thank you, that was very, very um, And you noticed it all goes perhaps back now to- Perhaps now a long, question. So, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, you know, when you make a documentary, listen, you know, people don't realize how much law, just, I will just say this to your audience, to, the, to, to you know, it's actually a whole field of practice of law here in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. probably also in France, where there are lawyers who do nothing but, you know, do opinion letters uh, so that you can get your uh, insurance so that no one can sue you, yeah. you know, for yeah. errors and omissions, you know, you have to have legal clearances for every single thing you do. Everyone has to sign releases, you know, every piece of footage, everything has to be fully documented legally. So we assume that 90% of the people watching this will become human rights attorneys, but 10% will become rich Hollywood attorneys. <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> so um, now if, if I may, we, we have um, a couple of questions for Madame Christiane ferral -Schul. So firstly, we were wondering what your impressions were after seeing the film. And then also, you've greatly contributed to making Mastering So Today's situation known in France. We even saw you unveiling her portrait outside of a, of a town hall in Paris last September. Could you tell us about the initiatives to support her from France? Um, for example, is the CNB in regular talks with other lawyers or human rights defenders in Iran to follow the situation? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for um, uh, having made this film and I understand that it was uh, difficult. I, I, I have a question. W just let me know when you started and when you finished the film, how long it lasted all together and then I can make the link with uh, what happened in Sept last September, October. Uh, sure. We started uh, filming in the middle of uh, 2016 and we finished editing at the beginning of 2020. Uh, but we've been in, you know, weekly or more contact with Nazarene's family as part of the campaign to release her, to bring her freedom as well. Okay. Um, uh, the, the first link I make uh, with uh, your film is um, uh, the phone exchange I had um, uh, with her uh, last uh, November. Uh, she was out of the prison and uh, I had the opportunity to call her through, uh, I, I think it was through WhatsApp. We, yes. we had the opportunity to uh, discuss and and I saw her and she looked so much like in the film and in a few minutes she told me so many things and um, she told me about her daughter. You mm. know that her daughter uh, had some uh, um, issues with the justice because uh, uh, she had been convoked be before the, as a, as a judge. Uh, finally, uh, her, her, she was very concerned with uh, this issue and uh, she told me about her son and um, you mentioned earlier that uh, um, the way she was um, uh, uh, taking her son to school, the way she, she just uh, had her son in her, she embraces the, her son, uh, it was so impressive and so much um, uh, there was a lot of emotion in uh, um, in what she said. So she was very uh, 
um, very happy to know that so many lawyers were uh, following uh, what was going on in uh, Iran. And these few minutes were more personal, more, more about the way she was uh, getting back in her in her private sphere. And um, um, so I, I, we feel this when, when, when we see the film at different moment, especially when she takes her son to school and um, at different places, we can see that there is a, a complete a mixture between her professional um, engagement and her personal life. Everything is linked. Uh, so just to go back to what happened uh, since August to 20, um, in order to demand the release of political prisoners, uh, Nasrin has started a hunger strike. Uh, her emergency hospitalization in Tehran uh, last September uh, uh, proved to be essential because of the serious heart and lung problems that followed. Uh, when she came out of the prison, uh, we were all very excited about this and we really thought that she wouldn't go back to prison uh, because uh, it was uh, uh, so impressive and uh, uh, we had the feeling that she was just coming back home. Um, but despite uh, the contrary opinion of the doctors who examined her, after a brief stay in hospital, she was immediately reincarcerated in Evan prison. Uh, you know this prison has a sinister reputation, you mentioned it, mm -hmm. without any medical care being provided. And um, despite her extremely pre precarious state of health, um, Nasrin was forced to end her hunger strike uh, because of her extremely weakened state of health. So um, her uh, recent transfer to the prison of uh, Karishak, uh, 30 kilometers from Tehran is um, a cause for great concern today. Apart from the deplorable sanitary conditions in this establishment, even uh, um, more uh, sinister than Evan prison, no measures have been taken to ensure that the care required uh, uh, is administered to her. So the COVID pandemic uh, uh, has spread uh, widely in Iran as everywhere else and has uh, already killed several thousand people with hundreds of new cases reported daily. And uh, we know that the virus is also spreading within the prisons and especially within Karshak prison. So in an attempt to prevent the spread of the virus, uh, you know that the Iranian government has provisionally released uh, uh, almost 100,000 prisoners, including the Franco-Iranian researcher. And uh, nevertheless, uh, we are in a situation uh, where our colleagues uh, have still not been released. So you asked me what has the National Bar Council has been doing. Uh, we are mobilized since March 2019 in collaboration with the CCBE and with the International Observatory for Lawyers. Uh, uh, we will uh, hear about it uh, uh, later. We have first of all adopted a motion um, in our General Assembly um, in 2019, uh, we have been launching an online petition calling for her release. And uh, this petition, which is a French uh, petition in French, has uh, gathered more than 500,000 signatures. And you can still go on signing it. Uh, we have wrote a letter to the president of the French Republic asking him to take any action in his support. Uh, we hanged her portrait, as you know, on the facade of the National Bar Council. It's a 400 square meters portrait. 
in order to raise public awareness. And quite often we have Iranian people in Paris coming inside the National Bar Council, thanking us for having um, uh, hanged this portrait and talking about what's going on in Iran. Uh, we also have applied her candidature for um, an award with uh, our um, uh, partners, uh, l'Observatoire International. Uh, uh, so uh, her candidature has been uh, um, has been uh, given through uh, the Conseil National des Barreaux. We adopted a motion also for her support within the G7 uh, lawyers. Uh, we wrote to all European heads of state and government. Uh, we launched uh, a one minute uh, Nasrin communication campaign with also our G7 partners. We deployed a lot of energy and you know that everywhere in France, uh, almost all the bars have a portrait of Nasrin so today and uh, trying to prevent her from falling into oblivion. So I think um, we did a lot. We know that uh, many other countries are involved. We know that uh, many uh, uh, bars are um, um, are working in order to uh, uh, to really give impulsion. Uh, I think it's very important for her to know we are in contact with her with her husband and uh, uh, it's quite difficult to have the contact, but um, she really represents for us um, a female lawyer, uh, engaged, courageous, and uh, even when she is uh, directly uh, in danger, she thinks about her colleagues. She asks that all politician lawyers go come out of the prisons. I mentioned that almost 100,000 uh, prisoners have been uh, uh, could get out of the prisons because of the COVID, but not the pol not the lawyers. Uh, and today, to know that she is back after this exchange we had. Uh, two female lawyers talking and it was just like if we were about to take a tea together. It was so simple and so easy to talk and um, she didn't complain. She didn't complain. She just said thank you. She said merci. She knows the word in French and she told me it's so important to know that people are thinking about us, but don't think only about me. Just know that my case, it's also the case of many other lawyers. Uh, she's just a symbol. And um, I think that she really, um, I don't know what is the uh, uh, English uh, word for incarné. She represents, she represents what uh, a, a lawyer, a lawyer, I would say a basic lawyer, uh, should uh, should uh, should uh, I, I I don't want to say should do. I will tell in in French. Uh, C'est l'ADN de l'avocat. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's really important. Uh, to show that uh, we need uh, lawyers like her because uh, if they don't exist, who is going to, uh, we say in French, porter la défense, la défense de la défense. Sorry, I may have been too long. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm a lawyer. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Can I just say that is so, <laughs> All your work and all your colleagues' work is so incredibly moving and inspiring. So, merci. And also, I must say, yes, you said so, really, it's incredible. And also, you really captured Nazreen. The way you talk about her, that's the Nazreen that we know also. Um, but I, 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 
do we have your permission to put your website, your this this petition on our website for the film? Because, you know, we would really like, you know, we're always sending people there to sign things. We've had a petition that's been going uh, with the Pen America, but we'd love to add that. And I just want to add, for you know, because, I, you know, Nazreen is obviously very well known in France. The, the international VOD is going to be available on International Women's Day, March 8th. So, you I know. Will ask uh, Catalina because I think that she uh, um, uh, she has a link on uh, Amnesty International right uh, petition, Catalina. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we could add Catalina the petition of the Conseil National des Barreaux. <laughs> yes, because we can sign both. Yes, and, just send uh, them to yeah. us. We'll put them yeah. on our website. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I think this could be um, the perfect moment to go from, as as Christian Perlouchul hinted, to, to the case of many other lawyers. So from Nasrin to the situation more widely of endangered lawyers in the world. And ask Jacques Buissou, um, as a member of the Paris Bar Council, you created the Observatoire des Avocats en Danger. And I think more recently, the Paris Bar Council initiated a program called RIPI, aiming at offering a form of asylum for endangered lawyers around the world. Um, could you tell us about these initiatives and perhaps give us an overview of more widely the threats faced by lawyers uh, beyond Iran? Uh, thank you very much, Katerina. And first, uh, congratulations to Jeff and Marcia. It's, it's really an impressive, uh, impressive movie you've done and uh, it's very important to, to raise awareness uh, around the globe on the uh, Nesrin situation. Th thank you very much for what you've done. Um, so, unfortunately, um, Nesrin situation is not the sole situation and we have to deplore uh, around the globe uh, a huge diversity of uh, threats against lawyers, uh, which is the reason why we have created the International Observatory for Endangered Lawyers. Um, and when we created this observatory in 2015, this was uh, following a very long tradition with the Paris Bar to uh, defend lawyers endangered around the, the, the world. Um, it was very um, typical from lawyers who were under threats in their country to call the dean of the Paris Bar uh, to help them. And Christian uh, has been a, a very uh, courageous dean of the Paris Bar and then of the, of the French Bar and continued with this uh, role of the of the, the French bar. And personally, uh, I had uh, the, the honor to uh, to meet with Chinese lawyers in Beijing in 2015. Uh, I met with them at the, the French embassy and um, they were uh, really under threat and they, they came to, to the embassy uh, under the, the protection of the French ambassador and uh, at the very last moment the ambassador told us we are not sure they, they would be allowed to come. Um, we have done everything we could to, uh, to, uh, to, to make sure uh, they would not be arrested before uh, entering the embassy and uh, they came. Um, unfortunately, a few weeks later, they were, most of them were, were uh, imprisoned again. So I will not mention their name because they are really under danger in, uh, in China. But that was my first experience with uh, lawyers endangered around the world. And the first thing they told us is, please help us. You are colleagues. You have to organize the mobilization of lawyers around the world. And a few weeks later, I had the same, uh, the same experience in uh, Istanbul, in Turkey, uh, where I met with uh, plenty of uh, uh, very courageous Turkish lawyers who were involved in the defense of uh, human rights or, or um, um, people involved in uh, various uh, political uh, uh, fight against uh, the, the, the Turkish government. Um, and I had exactly the same, the same, uh, the same question. Especially, it was very moving for me because. I had this question from uh, this lawyer, Ebru. Uh, you probably uh, heard of her. Uh, she died uh, a few months ago after uh, uh, hunger threat. 
she was a, a great lawyer. She was a fantastic woman. Uh, she she uh, she fought she fought uh, against um, well she fought for for human rights and for for the situation of uh, mothers in prisons and she was she was a great person she was a uh, she was a poetress she was a very funny lady and uh, well she she passed away um, a few months ago so it was I didn't know of course when I when I, I met with her the, what 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 would happen with her, but that's the situation of, of plenty of Turkish lawyers. And we know them very well because uh, that's probably the closest country to Europe. Uh, and we share with uh, Turkey the same, uh, the same legal body, with, which is the, the, the Human Rights Convention, the European Human Rights Convention, uh, which grants the same, uh, the same protection to Turkish lawyers uh, as to uh, European lawyers. So we know that if we leave them without uh, our mobilization, it means that we do not uh, pay attention to this um, European legal body that is supposed to grant the same rights uh, to lawyers in Turkey and, the, and in, in Europe. Um, and in Turkey, uh, whilst I, I was uh, mobilized to, uh, to defend colleagues before uh, Turkish courts in Istanbul in 2015, uh, I met plenty of lawyers coming from various countries, from African countries, from, uh, from America, from Spain, from Germany. And it was a pity because we realized we, we, we all came on our own uh, without any organization. And then we realized that by um, gathering uh, our forces, uh, we would be stronger because, of course, we could prepare things, we could uh, prepare awareness around our, our, our bars, our, our professional organizations, and when we could uh, in our countries. Uh, so that was the, the purpose of the, uh, the observatory. We created the observatory in 2015 with the, the CNB, the National Bar Organization, with the Paris Bar, with the Spanish uh, Bar Organization, the, the Italian Bar Organization, and then we were joined by many bar organizations around the world, uh, in Europe, in Africa, in America. Uh, and uh, because the, the, the idea is uh, that we are, we are stronger together, and the idea is to raise awareness um, through the links we have, all of us around the world. Uh, for instance, the Spanish bar, they know very well the, 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 the situation in Latin America. And uh, the situation in Latin America is very different from the situation in Saudi Arabia, for instance. In Latin America, we, we, we have horrible threats against lawyers, um, lawyers who defend uh, peasants against uh, drug organizations or against uh, landowners. And in, in small countries such as Honduras in 2015, uh, 11 lawyers were, were, were killed. Um, so it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. In, uh, in, uh, in Africa, you may have different threats for uh, lawyers who defend uh, sexual or religious minorities. Uh, for, for instance, uh, we all know Christian Nozer, and uh, I'm very impressed by this lady, Alison Combe in Cameroon. She, uh, she fights for, for gay lawyers. Um, in uh, Saudi Arabia, we all know uh, this guy, Walid Abu uh, uh, Al, Al Qaim. Uh, he has been sentenced to uh, 15 years in prison um, just for defending a, uh, a blogger. So that's uh, really the, um, the, the basic of uh, the freedom of expression. So there is a huge diversity uh, of threats against lawyers all around the, the world. And um, that was the purpose of the, uh, the observatoire. Um, what I should mention with, uh, with the, the diversity of uh, threats uh, around the globe, and I think it is important for you guys, uh, young lawyers, future lawyers, uh, is that, um, of course, in Europe we have the, the convention, but outside Europe, uh, lawyers are very weak. Uh, and you have to know that there is a, there is a chart uh, that, that is called the, the Abana Principles um, that grant, uh, under the authority of the United Nations, that grant uh, basic principles to lawyers. 
basic principles that, that are really uh, very um, we are used to them, such as the independence of lawyers, the freedom of expression. Uh, so for us, it's, it's something very common, but um, in plenty of countries uh, that I mentioned and to in other countries, these are not uh, common rights for lawyers. So I think it's important for you to know uh, the existence of uh, this, uh, this chart, because you may have uh, in your professional life uh, opportunities to uh, to uh, to act for foreign lawyers or to help foreign lawyers who are endangered or endangered or under threats in their countries. Uh, I'm sorry, Catalina, I've been perhaps too long, but I wanted to uh, to uh, to respond um, as widely as I could to your question. Uh, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I add some? Sure. Uh, just like, Just like we saw, I, I had, had opportunity. opportunity. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. We do hear your question very well. OK, uh, just like uh, Jacques Buissou in um, uh, China, I had the opportunity to uh, meet uh, uh, the families of prisoners, not the prisoners themselves at the French embassy. Uh, they came and they came with the help of the uh, ambassador and our uh, Garde des Sceaux, our Minister of Justice was uh, there too. So we were a small group and uh, the most impressive thing uh, which uh, came out of the discussion is that a way to, um, uh, to put um, uh, pressure on uh, the prisoners is to um, forbid to, to the children are not allowed to go to school. And it's uh, we 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 don't imagine this, but I understood that the children could not go to school. So the families in a solidarity um, uh, manner decided to give education to their children, but uh, it was education uh, there were 10 of them uh, getting this education and uh, they we understood at uh, when they explained what was going on that uh, a way to be sure that the prisoners are put aside for decennies is to uh, to prevent the families to have social life, to go to, to to have their children going to school, etc. And they're not also in connection with the medias. So this possibility of having discussion with us, uh, with our Minister of Justice, with our ambassador, was a way to just to remember that in some countries, uh, human rights is something important. And they decided to go out of the embassy uh, with, uh, um, you know, they came in cars uh, with black windows and uh, they were protected, but they decided to go out by foot. And they said, whatever comes out now, we will say that we were coming out from the French embassy and they refused to be protected. And we were very worried for them. Uh, but we understood how uh, it's important for the prisoners to have the solidarity also of their families. Uh, but this is part of the most uh, um, impressive things I have seen. I must say the emotion is so important in this situation. So I just wanted to add this because uh, Jacques mentions that he met the prisoners in, um, in the embassy. And I was very proud, really, to see our institution yeah. and uh, uh, to see our ambassador acting this way. Really, I was uh, feeling well. I really agree, Christian, with what you have said, because uh, France is a country committed to the defense of the lawyers around the globe. I've seen this in China. I've seen this in, uh, in Turkey, in Istanbul, for instance. 
the, the, the representative of the French consulate came with us to the hearings uh, just to show the awareness of the French government uh, for, for the, the fate of the French, uh, the, of the Turkish lawyers uh, that, were, uh, that were judged before, uh, before Istanbul courts. And uh, one of my best memories as a lawyer was to uh, when I defended uh, Aisha Sinikli, who, who is a, a Turkish female lawyer, uh, very courageous and, and committed to, uh, to the defense of mothers in, uh, in jail. She was sentenced to, uh, to prison and, uh, and we obtained a release. And I, I, I was with her uh, when she was released um, at, at the door of the gate, at the gate of the prison. And it was a, a, a fantastic moment for, for, for a lawyer to see a, a colleague uh, released for, from her prison uh, with all her family, all her friends from the village coming to the, to the, to the jail uh, just to uh, welcome her outside the, the gate of the jail. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jacques Bissou and Christiane Varalechoul. These, these experiences uh, beyond Iran are really interesting. And, and, and also it's interesting for us as trainee lawyers to, to understand what is at stake, to, to see what, it, uh, what can be done later on when, well, now and then also once we, can, once we become lawyers. Um, so that is very interesting. Thank you. Perhaps um, we haven't heard uh, yet about Madame, uh, from Madame Azadi Kian. Um, I think we would be very interested to hear um, first your impressions about the film as, uh, as, as we heard you, you watched the film twice and also um, in the film it is explained uh, that previous to 1979 uh, women in Iran could go to university, could travel and have a normal job without asking their husband. Um, so what exactly, uh, Madame Kian, what exactly is the situation of women in Iran today? Um, yes, uh, I, actually, um, I uh, very much liked the documentary uh, because, as Jeff and Marcia mentioned, um, they were also but showing Nasreen uh, in uh, both uh, in her struggles as a lawyer under the Islamic regime of Iran, but also as a mother, as a wife, and so on. So in her ordinary life, and um, she uh, uh, kind of showed that also. Uh, it was not only Nasreen who is struggling and who is fighting, she is representing a lot of other Iranians. And I should say that fear has changed sides. And if somebody like Nasreen and many tens of other uh, women are now political prisoners, uh, it is because uh, the Islamic regime really fears them uh, and the women's struggles in Iran. Um, now, um, uh, going back to uh, your question, um, well, uh, they, there were some inaccuracies uh, in, in the film, though. Uh, for instance, uh, even before the revolution, um, uh, women, in order uh, to leave the country, needed their husband's authorization. And the number of women in universities was only 57,000. I went to university in Iran uh, before the revolution and were only 57,000 people, or, or, uh, whereas the Iranian population was about 32 million. Nowadays, you have over 4 million women in Iranian universities uh, and the population is 80 million. So uh, to show that women have really struggled uh, under the Islamic regime to get into universities, to higher education, and you have uh, as many uh, educated women in the whole country as educated men, and actually the number of women uh, is now uh, much more than the number of men as you know educated. Um, nonetheless, and despite this, uh, only about 20% of them can get to job markets, and uh, there are a lot of impediments on uh, um, put uh, 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 or obstacles um, against uh, women's access uh, to equality. And for this very reason, uh, Nasrin's uh, struggle uh, and other uh, human rights and women's rights activists uh, is crucial uh, to change the laws and uh, also uh, bring other women who have been silent into uh, this battle, um, but, uh, but, but nonetheless, you can see that, for instance, recently uh, something was mentioned in the <clears throat> documentary 
<coughs> was uh, this personalized politics, so this is what I call personalized politics, uh, of these young women who uh, unveil in, in public, for instance, at the Avenue Engelab. Um, but uh, also more recently, the Me Too movement had arrived in Iran and many women uh, are now talking about having been harassed uh, or, or raped and so on by some uh, very well-known men. Uh, so these are all uh, uh, also other types of struggles uh, women are conducting against inequalities uh, and against uh, discriminations uh, um, that are at the foundation uh, of uh, the Islamic um, regime. And so um, I understand there's um, a presidential election coming up very soon in Iran. Uh, change in any way the situation for human <clears throat> rights defenders such as so today? Well, unfortunately, what is uh, going on is that um, uh, due to American sanctions uh, that were set by uh, President Trump uh, uh, in 2018, uh, the situation, political situation in Iran uh, has uh, really uh, de uh, uh, deteriorated uh, and uh, we have now more repression uh, ever since the, uh, the sanctions. Uh, the Iranian population was very, very hopeful uh, in July 2015 when uh, the JCPOA, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the treaty uh, over the Iranian nuclear uh, was uh, signed um, at the international level by the you know, Security Council, members of the Security Council, and then when President Trump imposed his sanctions, uh, uh, so the regime became even more repressive uh, against uh, all opponents and uh, 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 and all those who demand democracy, equal rights, and so on, both uh, women's rights activists, human rights activists, minority rights activists, and so on. Now, with uh, President Biden in power, um, uh, another, uh, you know, we hope that they can uh, get together again, Americans and Iranians, with, uh, with of, uh, of course, Europeans, uh, in order to uh, kind of uh, revive this JCPOA and also in order. Uh, for the Iranian population to benefit from uh, the uh, economic and financial uh, consequences of JCPOA. Um, but um, actually, unfortunately, um, uh, reformers and moderates uh, have been pushed aside uh, due to sanctions. And uh, today you have basically conservatives who uh, have gained the majority in the parliament because each time we know that only a few number of uh, voters vote uh, then you get conservative or ultra-conservative uh, parliament and also the fear is actually that the risk is that uh, in the upcoming elections uh, uh, we will have a conservative president um, and also we have seen that um, paradoxically uh, the American um, sanctions uh, have reinforced the Revolutionary Guards, uh, Postaran, uh, who are actually both military, economic, financial, and political power in uh, in Iran who have this this power and they have been strengthened. So it is going to be very difficult for Americans and Europeans uh, to negotiate with Iranians, uh, but um, you know hope is uh, still there uh, so that we can get out of this. Uh, uh, impasse and all of this um, uh, situation. As you know, uh, uh, economic situation in Iran is really very tough, very hard, uh, and um, um, so people are basically, um, you know, they are forced to take care of their everyday living. Uh, and so if you are, and when you are um, uh, kind of uh, busy, you know, looking for a job or looking uh, for something to bring to your family to eat, then you are less attentive to who is in prison as political prisoner or uh, what are democratic issues or, you know, uh, uh, whether or not we should struggle for democracy. So I personally think that uh, whenever sanctions are lifted and if uh, Iran Iranians can uh, have an I should say, ordinary uh, uh, life, uh, then we can hope that uh, this society uh, that 
um, uh, Jeff and um, Marcia were talking about in their movie, uh, that is this common humanity that we share with Iranians uh, can uh, be uh, actually can become predominant and uh, uh, we can always hope uh, for uh, a, a democratic system in Iran because the society, I believe, is uh, quite um, ready for it. Uh, political Islam in Iran uh, has uh, shown its uh, important shortcomings. Um, I think that Iran is a very good example of, of for, for throughout the region, but also in the whole world, to see and to show that when political Islam um, is in power, uh, it is just um, uh, incapable of uh, responding to people's demands and it just becomes a very, very repressive authoritarian regime. Uh, so uh, this is the you know, situation where you have, on the one hand, a society that is um, very uh, well-educated, uh, you know, the majority, the extreme majority, 90, or, or almost 98% of uh, Iranian uh, youth uh, is uh, literate. And as I mentioned, over 4 million women uh, are uh, in universities and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, you have um, uh, very regressive um, uh, institutions and political elite in power. And this should change, but this cannot change if um, uh, uh, sanctions are not lifted and if uh, Iran is uh, not reintegrated into the international community. Thank you very much, Madam Ken. There, there was a very insightful um, point about the situation in Iran today. Uh, perhaps the last question for you, and then, well, the same question perhaps for all of us, that each one of us can perhaps uh, take on. Um, at one point in the film, there was this, this idea that um, uh, that human rights is a Western concept. You know, Nasrin Sotoudeh says, well, uh, the, the people who want to throw and say that human rights is a Western concept, and, and clearly I don't agree. Um, uh, what, what would be your, your reaction to, to this? Absolutely not. Of course, human rights is uh, a universal uh, <clears throat> um, a phenomenon, universal um, a demand. And uh, I should say that Cyrus the Great, who was the king of Iran 2,500 years ago, uh, is known uh, to be uh, the first uh, uh, person who uh, has raised the issue of human rights. He is the one uh, who, uh, as you know, liberated uh, Jews in Babylonia uh, and so on. So Iranians are quite familiar with this notion of human rights, but also women's rights nowadays. And you have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people who uh, have been and still are struggling for human rights in, this, in, in their countries. Uh, and even some of these people are religious ones who have written books to say that there is no such a thing as Islamic human rights. Uh, there is only human rights. We are all humans and we should be all equal. And uh, so I think that, uh, uh, of course, Nasrin is uh, particularly right. Something else I would like, if I may, to add is I uh, we forgot to say that uh, Nasrin also represented other imprisoned lawyers when she herself was not imprisoned yet. Uh, but she also rep uh, represented in Iran uh, imprisoned lawyers, um, and then she also represented a, a lot of opponents after the 2009 uh, Green Movement in, in Iran. And for all these reasons, uh, Nasrin is really uh, very well known uh, within within the country for her for her courage. Uh, but I, I also want to add that. Um, she, again, she also kind of, she is a role model, uh, but, but also she kind of represents uh, this uh, new generation of Iranians who really aspire to uh, freedom and to democracy. Perhaps on this question of, of the universality of, of of human rights, would, uh, would Christiane Ferralchul or, or Jacques Buissou want to, to react? Yes, uh, thank you. I fully agree with uh, what you said. Uh, of course, it's uh, uh, universal. I would say it's the noblesse de l'avocat. Uh, 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 can you just imagine a world where there would be no human rights? 
human rights is really uh, the defense of people who needs who are victims, victims of everything. Uh, the, the choice of their religions, the choice of their political uh, opinions, the choice of their um, um, whatever. They are not in, in the right tracks. People are saying that they are not in the right tracks and uh, they need help. And who else than a lawyer can really um, help them um, and 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 really um, make the justice give sense to justice. So once again, just think about the world without human rights. A world where lawyers would not be there to really help them help these victims. Well, I, I, uh, if I may say, uh, uh, Mrs. Christian Ferraccio, um, that uh, I think the struggle for human rights uh, goes beyond in these countries, at least in the Middle East um, and elsewhere. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it, it goes uh, far beyond uh, having or not a lawyer, because as you know, in the, for instance, Iranian judicial, judicial system, um, many uh, political prisoners um, are even devoid of lawyers. They don't even have the right to have a lawyer. Nonetheless, the issue of human rights, equal universal human rights, and so on and so forth, is a, a very broad issue that is kind of uh, being uh, discussed and being demanded. Uh, and uh, so it's not just, of course, in systems where you can have a lawyer, uh, it is much, much better, but you have, again, authoritarian regimes who do not even accept uh, the very uh, idea of, uh, 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 you know, a, a lawyer defending uh, uh, prisoners. And so uh, even recently in Iran, several uh, Baluchi uh, political prisoners, Kurd, Kurdish prison, political prisoners uh, were executed and these people did not even have the right to have a lawyer. Uh, uh, nonetheless, we should continue to uh, kind of praise human rights, universal human rights, and so on, and of course, the right to have uh, a lawyer to represent you in the court. Uh, unfortunately, the Iranian judicial system is absolutely everything but justice. There is, a, I agree, there is a right of having a lawyer, and there is a second step is to allow the lawyer to express himself, yes. uh, and it's la liberté de parole. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have two steps, and then you have uh, the uh, importance of lawyers involved in human rights. This mm -hmm. is what I want to point that out, but you are perfectly right. Mm -hmm. There are three steps. Well, I, I agree to that. Human rights are a universal concern and not a Western, uh, a Western concept. I know that uh, plenty of governments around the globe uh, do uh, do uh, do state that uh, human rights are a Western idea, but that's a way for them to fight against human rights. Uh, we, we have to remind that uh, human rights were not invented in Europe, but in, uh, in Latin America. The first time that uh, uh, um, a concern for human rights was raised uh, was for, for the Indians uh, with uh, Bartolomé de las Casas in Latin America. Uh, so it's not a European, a European concept, it's, it's a universal concept. So we have, uh, as, a, as a European lawyers, we have to fight for human rights and we have to help, as Christian said, uh, lawyers abroad uh, to fight for human rights when they can, because in plenty of countries it's not possible, or human rights defenders, because in, in some countries, such as China, for instance, where lawyers are disbarred, um, they are no longer lawyers, they are called human rights defenders, because they can't, they can't practice law because they are just disbarred. So uh, it's not it's not a Western con concept. 
it's, it is a universal concept and a universal concern. Thank you very much. I, I, um, I'm perhaps sorry, <laughs> because we, 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 uh, this, this topic came through Iran. And um, I remember that uh, last year uh, I met with Sherin Ibadi, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, in Brussels, um, where uh, with the CCB, Christian, you mentioned the CCB, so for, for everyone to know, the CCB is the European Bar Council. So we, we gave Sherin Ibadi, uh, uh, well, we didn't give the prize to her, but to Nasrin, and Sherin came to Brussels to receive uh, the prize on behalf of uh, Nasrin Sotoudeh, because of course uh, Nasrin Sotoudeh could not come to Brussels. And uh, Nasrin, um, Sherin, sorry, Sherin Ibadi, stated, stated very clearly that human rights are a universal concern and that in Iran, they need our mobilization for human rights in, uh, in Iran. So no, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I completely uh, support the idea of human rights as, as a universal idea and universal concept. Uh, may I repeat you. that uh, uh, you have um, uh, the the élèves avocats uh, can participate uh, to the concours de Caen, uh, which is a very important and fabulous, really, place to be, because um, uh, the pleadings on human rights are just uh, are just fabulous, really. Mm. And uh, you have the opportunity to participate and uh, the 10 best uh, pleadings uh, will be in competition uh, next January. May I add something, Christian, yes. which is, uh, uh, which is um, a hot topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the CCB, the European Bar Council, uh, we are uh, setting up um, an, an award, it is more or less the same kind of award as the Memorial de Caen, uh, which is, but it will be an Amicus Curie award uh, for, um, for young lawyers and future lawyers all around Europe, uh, dedicated to the defense of lawyers, to the defense of endangered lawyers. So the first edition will be in 2022, uh, next year, not this year, I'm sorry, but for those of you guys who will still be uh, who will still be in the UFB next year? You are welcome to participate as uh, students or as young lawyers. The purpose of this uh, this uh, competition will be to uh, to uh, to speak on behalf of lawyers endangered in their countries and uh, to draft an amicus curiae to show um, to a, a jury what are the legal issues at stake. Uh, in the very situation of each lawyers. So this will be um, something very interesting uh, to which you, you, uh, you will be uh, able to participate soon with the uh, UFB. Uh, these different prices are uh, important for lawyers because it's a way to protect them in their countries. Yeah. I would like to give you the uh, example of Valdenia Paulino. I invited, Valdenia Paulino is a Brazilian uh, lawyer. I invited her on, the, uh, on March 2013 in Paris for the uh, Journée Internationale des Droits uh, uh, des Femmes. And uh, uh, she came to tell her story and to exchange. There were other fabulous uh, lawyers, female lawyers from different countries. And uh, Valdenia Paulino, coming from a favela in uh, Brasilia, and she grew up in a favela, decided to help young, uh, young girls to get out of the prostitution in favelas. So she has been uh, her, herself tortured and uh, received uh, so many, uh, uh, how do you say, menaces de mort, uh, and uh, she has been held by Amnesty International. She was extradited to Spain and she could go back to Brazil. And we invited her in Paris. 
she came and told about the work she's doing to help all the human rights she is really um, doing there. And she didn't choose to work in big, important uh, um, uh, cabinet d'avocats at Sao Paulo. She chose to be in the favelas. And uh, when she get, went back to Brazil, she sent me a letter, a very beautiful letter in which, in which she told me, you know, it was so important for me to be invited in Paris because as the authorities, have been informed about this invitation. And for the first time of my life, I received uh, protection. And uh, she had two policemen to protect her from uh, uh, all, uh, all, all the type of, uh, of dangers she was, uh, uh, she was uh, dealing with every every day. And so next year, and this is why I'm mentioning her example, because I could give you hundreds of examples, but her example, she received the Prix CCBE in 2014. And uh, she is still very active and she is still doing a fabulous work. And she is a human right lawyer. We are on the step three. She is allowed to be um, um, a lawyer. In her country, it's possible, but you cannot always afford a lawyer. So these lawyers are working in very difficult conditions. And the uh, lead juridictionnelle doesn't exist in all countries. Um, if, if I may say, if I may say, I, I definitely do agree uh, with you to say that um, Price is uh, uh, is uh, uh, likely to uh, kind of uh, um, how to put it to protect uh, the recipients. But but um, my understanding also is that if we could have collective price for a number of lawyers in these countries uh, who are really fighting, struggling, trying to kind of uh, advocate human rights, universal human rights, and so on. Uh, it is even better than just to hand the prize to one single person, mm -hmm. uh, because this can leave uh, aside uh, kind of others uh, who are fighting as well. Uh, so what do you think about this uh, kind of collective price? I don't know whether it is, uh, uh, does exist um, uh, when it comes to lawyers, but it does exist for other you know, human rights uh, defenders. Uh, well, yes. the, the, the question is it's interesting. The, you know, uh, quite often uh, I was told, why did you choose Nasrin Sotoude and not other lawyers? You know, there are many other uh, lawyers in Iran doing the uh, same thing. At some point, I think that the important is to have a uh, um, you know, to give uh, uh, personality. Uh, people need to identify someone and to have a symbol. So I understand that uh, uh, there are many people, many, many lawyers around her. Um, it's a difficult question. Your question is a difficult one. Uh, would uh, she, uh, would it be a good thing to have uh, 15 or 30 lawyers uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, the risk is to uh, have um, a message less uh, stronger, less stronger. I, 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 I think, but I may be wrong. I don't pretend that. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, actually, I, I actually, what I'm not saying, I'm not saying that uh, you should, uh, you know, Nasty shouldn't have received any prize. It's absolutely not what I'm saying. But she has received several of these prizes, as you know better than I do, and other lawyers, uh, including feminist ones or those who are also defending women's rights and so on, uh, have been left aside, and this has given them the impression that they are not or they have not been taken into account, that there is just one single person who has become the icon of or the you know role model. Mm -hmm. And 
this might be to the detriment of abs, abs, actually what Nasrin is doing because she is not <clears throat> saying, as we could see in this uh, film, she's not saying I'm the only one, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm the one who, uh, uh, you know, is defending, you know, people's rights. Uh, she, she's also referring also to others. Um, so refusing to kind of also hand uh, prizes to others as a collectivity, and uh, this is what I'm talking about, uh, might um, uh, give the impression, and I, as far as I know, it has given the impression. If, if I can reassure, it's not the case at all. But uh, that Western is not, I'm yeah, talking I, about uh, those who are in Iran, and this is how they feel, yeah. and this is how they say, what, what they say, sorry, that um, they, uh, you know, they have totally forgotten us as if we, have, we are not doing anything for uh, defending, uh, you know, prisoners' rights or whatever, you know. What, what you are saying is very important. Uh, yeah. if, if you could pass the, the message back, it's not the case at all. Uh, and uh, I'm talking as a member of the European Bar Council, uh, where we have discussed the situation of uh, many Iranian lawyers uh, and I remember very well last June, we had uh, a list of uh, plenty of uh, Iranian lawyers uh, and they were proposed as a collective group for, for, for the prize. Um, so they are not forgotten at all. We, we are following them very carefully and uh, each week or, or each month or each week, the, the, the president of the European Bar Council is drafting letters to the Iranian government to, uh, to state uh, the situation of, of precise lawyers um, uh, on, on which, uh, on which, on whose situation we have been, uh, we have been alerted. So we are following their situation very, very carefully. But it's important to what, what you say, because I will report it to, you, to the Human, Human Rights Committee of the, of the European Bar Council, because uh, of course, we, we, we must make sure that uh, nobody uh, mm -hmm is uh, under the impression of, uh, of being forgotten. This, this would be uh, very sad. Okay, absolutely. And I'm sorry, we're running out of time. Could I ask each one of you to make uh, some brief final remarks, something you want to, to take away or, or really emphasize on uh, before, before we all have to leave? May, may I say something uh, with regard to Nasreen uh, only? Um, and um, but we, we, we talk about Nasreen, of course, Nasreen so today. Um, but, but we should also pay tribute to Reza Khandan, <laughs> the husband, uh, who has been really uh, supporting Nasreen and Nasreen's struggles for many, many years and encouraging her. Um, I think he has played a crucial role in making what Nasrin is. That's very true. Thank you. A good point to uh, mention the family because the family is very closely uh, associated uh, to what uh, uh, what uh, the, in the investment. Uh, I would like to. Um, uh, my final thought about this discussion is to say that uh, being a lawyer is a chance, really. It's a big chance because uh, we have the opportunity to uh, to do something. You know, what is important in life is, I always say this, is faire bouger les lignes. We have always the possibility to, to add you know, this little or big impulsion uh, which gives the feeling that we are we are helping. We are contributing to something we think should be better in the world we are all living in. So it's a question of value, of ethic, of um, personal investment and involvement. And my, my own last few words would be uh, also for the family. I've been moved in the movie to see um, to see Nasrin with uh, kids in the prison. And uh, I've been moved 
uh, by the way she was trying to smile in front of uh, her little boy uh, while her daughter was crying and uh, was was trying to hide uh, for in order for her brother not to see her crying and um, you, you could see in the, in the eyes of Nasrin uh, she was trying to maintain a, a smile to be uh, to, to give a good image to uh, to a, a young boy and um, that would be my my last word what I saw in Nasrin's eyes was her faith um, and I think she has a very strong faith in the role of the defense and uh, I think it's a, it's a very strong message she sent to us with, uh, with her smiling eyes in the faith of, uh, of our duty and in the faith of uh, our role uh, as uh, defenders. Thank you very much. I think it was, uh, it was beautiful to finish on, on the family and the film definitely shows the how well it sh it shows the lawyer it shows the mother it shows it sh it shows how how Nasrin's fight for human rights is also really linked with who she is in real life and and I think that's beautiful um, so thank you very much for for your points I think this was particularly interesting uh, we had. Well, we had the, the unfortunately the producers had to leave us, but we, we had the the, the the viewpoint of the producers in in Iran. We had the viewpoint of of a professor who who really knows about the Iranian situation. Thank you very much, Madame Tian, and we had the position uh, <laughs> of Madame Faralshul and uh, uh, and Jacques Bissou. So thank you so much. Uh, I think we all learned a lot, and uh, and. Uh, and while we go and, and have dinner and have a nice evening, I guess let's remember that uh, that Nasrin is in prison, that she's uh, she's been condemned to to a very extreme sentence, and uh, and and let's continue to try to raise awareness um, around her around her case and her situation. So thank you very much to to thank, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you all of you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Right. And congratulations you. for the event. It, it has been a great event. Yes, congratulations. Thank Bye. you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye.